next door A girl she lives About the same age as me And asked me to come upstairs For the see Just then her mother burst in Said you're the son of that bitch in the wind Get out of my Shouted, help me, mother. I'm going straight to hell. 
Somebody's home, a woman is sleeping, a man sits alone, alone, all alone. And then comes the dawning, and then comes the morn. The woman is yawning, in daylight, and daylight, and daylight, and daylight is born. The roar of an engine, the coffee pot works, then off to the office to a room full of jerks again. Once again. That captured Hercules and the Golden Fleece again. Once again, the evening painted mountains, paintings looking fine. He put away his brushes and went out for, he went out for some wine. Once again, having met a woman. For some man, he loved her like his paintings, and he wondered, and he wondered, and he wondered, he wondered if she cared.
Hello and welcome to the Know Before You Go live stream hosted by Mammut. My name is McKinley. I'm the Know Before You Go coordinator here at the Utah Avalanche Center. and I want to welcome you all to a great start of the winter we're having so far. We just got our first snowfall in Utah this past week. I'm sure a lot of you have seen some snow out there in the mountains. It's a great time to brush up on your avalanche awareness skills. Take a look at your gear, dial in all those batteries, make sure everything's working properly. But more importantly, this is a best time of year to brush up on your avalanche skills, right? Whether that's attending one of these presentations or organizing a day next week to go out with your friends and practice your rescue skills. I certainly am excited for the next wave of snow that's gonna come through. It's looking like here in Utah, maybe at the end of this week, maybe even tomorrow, we'll see some snow. Everyone's itching to ride. And personally, I'm super excited for the start of the season. Um, but before we get out there on the hill, uh, like I said, Perfect time to brush up on your avalanche skills. And that's why we're here today. We're here to talk to you about avalanches. Know Before You Go program 
uh, is designed to be the first step in anyone's avalanche education journey, as well as serving as a refresher for those who might know a little bit more. Um, so we really try to hit uh, all types of learning levels in this program, uh, and good on you for being here today. So yeah, let's jump right into it. The Know Before You Go program. Uh, well, why am I here teaching this to you today, or presenting this program? Well, I grew up in New York State uh, in the icy hills of the Catskills. Uh, not tons of avalanches occurring out east, right? Every now and then we get maybe one or two every, every three or four years, but they're really weird, strange avalanches that most people don't pay attention to. Like many of you, I moved out west right after high school. I moved to Utah. Um, started exploring the backcountry through side country gates at the resorts. Uh, and it, I learned pretty quickly that if I didn't learn about avalanches and give the mountains the respect that they deserve, I might not make it uh, throughout my entire life enjoying a healthy lifestyle in the mountains. Right? I learned that I needed to give mountains the respect they deserve, learn about avalanches to help myself stay safe. And that's why I'm here today, because I love sharing the information that I've learned um, in avalanche classes, talking with tons of different avalanche professionals, and transferring that knowledge onto you. So thanks for being here today. So what is the Know Before You Go program? Well, the Know Before You Go program over the past two years uh, has been revamped from its older version. We worked with Avalanche Canada, a bunch of us at the Utah Avalanche Center, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, uh, the Northwest Avalanche Center, and even the National Avalanche Center. Tons of avalanche professionals have come together to create this program to not only be the first step in anyone's avalanche education journey, but also to serve as that refresher for those of you who might know a little bit more. And of course, none of this would be able to happen without our sponsors, especially Mammut. If you see them out there on the hill, give them a big high five and show them your support. So how many people out there have taken an avalanche class before? Whether you've seen this presentation or you've gone on snow with an avalanche professional, how many people out there have never had any avalanche education in the past? This is your first time talking about avalanches. No matter which category you fall into, you're right where you're supposed to be. Like I said, this program is designed to be the first step in anyone's avalanche education journey, as well as serving up uh, the refresher, uh, fundamental knowledge that everyone can continue to learn uh, and come back to at the end of the day. So I'm gonna start the presentation off with a question. What is an avalanche? While there are many types of avalanches, such as slab, loose snow, dry avalanches, wet avalanches, an avalanche is simply snow falling down a hill. They're fast, scary, highly consequential events that can cause a lot of harm. Sometimes in the news, you'll read about an avalanche striking a victim, a seemingly freak act of nature. The truth is, however, avalanches don't just strike randomly. For an avalanche to occur, you need a simple recipe of a slab, a weak layer, a slope steep enough to slide, and a trigger, which can be you. By learning about avalanches and how to avoid them, you actually have the ability to increase your odds uh, in your favor and stay safe while in the mountains. Avoiding avalanches is the best way to stay safe, and in order to do that, you need to get an avalanche education. How many people out there are skiers? How many people are snowboarders? Any snowmobilers, snowshoers? How many people go out into the mountains with their family during the holidays for a walk in the snow? No matter the activity, everyone who travels in snow-covered mountains needs to learn about avalanches. Well, why is that? Because avalanches don't discriminate. Wherever there's snow in the mountains, avalanches can occur, no matter what activity, skiing, snowboarding, snowmobiling, hiking, any other activity in the mountains. Avalanches unfortunately claim the lives of 27 people each year on average in the United States alone. The slopes that you see in these photos look small and safe, yet they're both actually the scenes of fatal avalanches. Avalanche in the photo on the right killed a young lady who was hiking beneath it. And the slope on the left killed a snowboarder who was just using it as a landing zone beneath the jump. Avalanches don't discriminate. You don't have to be riding a massive peak, skiing a gnarly couloir. You don't have to be in those big ski line, ski movie lines, right? They happen anywhere where there's the right recipe. Can anyone guess what these two slopes have in common? They all occurred on slopes steeper than 30 degrees. And we're going to touch, about, touch on that a little bit later in the presentation, but I want to plant that seed in your head right now. In Canada, they have about 10 fatalities per season. And in Europe, it's about 100, right? That's a ton. So that brings us to the Know Before You Go program. Before you go into the mountains, you must know the mountains. 
right? So in this program, we're going to teach you how to get the forecast, how to get the gear, how to get the training, and then finally putting it all together and getting the picture. We're about to go over what an avalanche forecast is, what it's used for, how it's made, and where to find it. We'll then teach you what gear is essential to have while traveling in the backcountry and why it's so dangerous to leave out even one of these items. We're going to talk about where to find avalanche education, why you need it, how it can help you avoid getting caught in an avalanche. And finally, we're going to put it all together and get the picture. We'll talk about how to utilize your gear, your training, and stay aware in the mountains while all staying safe, returning to your car at the end of the day. So how do we start? Well, first we're going to talk about getting the forecast, right? In this section, we're going to talk about how to know when and where to go when you're in the mountains and also where to find your regional avalanche forecast. Let's take a, day, a look at the day in the life of an avalanche forecaster in this video. So we are, uh, we're due north at about 8,200 feet here, Nikki. And do you know the slope angle? You want to get a reading of that real quick? In 2004, my dad and his two partners were actually caught in a pretty major avalanche here in the Wasatch backcountry. All of them were caught in the avalanche and they all ended up with injuries. Being the person on the other side of the fence, it's pretty traumatic when your loved one is involved in an avalanche. That accident really propelled me forward um, into what I believe is my avalanche career now. You know, it's the people that don't understand the risk. That's what keeps me up at night. That's who I'm trying to reach. As avalanche forecasters, we're really focused on helping the public understand what they're going to face out there in the mountains. And we want them to go out and enjoy the mountains, have great experiences, and at the end of the day, come home back to their loved ones. Whether you're walking your dog, skiing, snowboarding, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, if you're heading out into mountains that have snow, you need to get an avalanche forecast. forecasting is you're taking all of these different data points and all this really complex information and you're synthesizing it into something simple. Uh, Nikki, 80 is minus 2, oh 90 minus 3, so nice temperature gradient there between those two layers. We're looking at observations from the public, from professional users, observations that we personally get in the field. And what we mean by those observations is snow pit results, uh, new snow instabilities, wind, weather, anything that's actually going on in the backcountry, recent avalanches. Uh, this is two to four millimeter near surface facets. Then we're putting that all in together and we're trying to get one simplified bottom line statement for what's going on. Avalanche forecasts can really come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Different centers might use a little different format, but the bottom line, all of us are focusing about on the same information across the globe. No matter where you are in the world, avalanche information is right at your fingertips. And that's gonna be weather information, snowpack information, information about recent avalanches, and what the overall avalanche danger is in a mountain range. When you first check the forecast, one of the first things you're gonna see is that bottom line statement. In that, we're gonna discuss the avalanche danger scale. The avalanche danger scale consists of five ascending levels from low to extreme. Your chance of encountering an avalanche increases dramatically with each level. So we've got this scale that discusses size and distribution, the likelihood, and then overall travel advice for the day. Beyond just the bottom line statement, we're gonna see avalanche problems. 
It's just really important to recognize that there's different types of avalanches. The avalanche forecast is gonna give you that information, which ultimately you can use to make better choices in the mountains. An avalanche forecast isn't just done by one person. It's a huge team effort, not only by the forecast staff, but also by our local communities. What I find so special about the mountains is really the freedom and the friendships that you create out there. And it's my hope that other people can go into the mountains and experience the same joy that I do, and ultimately at the end of the day, come home safe. I want to give a big shout out to Sheriff of Cinemas who helped produce these videos. I think they came out excellently. You get me super excited for the winter. Um, but also, I want to mention that after this presentation, we're going to be doing a live Q&A. So if you have any questions for us, just text them into that number you see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer them after this presentation. So let's talk about that video for a second. What are some things included in an avalanche forecast? Well, first, I'll tell you the bottom line statement, right? So what's going on in the mountains? They're also going to tell you about recent weather, upcoming weather, recent avalanches, and also different types of avalanche problems that are existing in the mountains on any given day. But let's take a step back for a second. Where do you find these avalanche forecasts? Well, luckily, no matter where you're on the world, if there's snow in the mountains, there's probably a regional avalanche forecast that you can read. If you're in the United States, go to avalanche.org. If you're in Canada, it's avalanche.ca. And if you're in Europe, it's avalanches.org. Right, and it'll pop up to one of these screens, and you can click on the map to where you are, and you can find your regional avalanche forecast. Here in North America, we have the North American uh, Public Avalanche Danger Scale. And the colors you see here represent the avalanche danger rating, which is the backbone of every avalanche forecast. You can see here from the North American Danger Scale, there are five danger ratings, low, moderate, considerable, high, and extreme. Even at low danger rating, while human-triggered avalanches are unlikely, they're not impossible. Can you guess at what avalanche danger rating most fatalities occur? Yeah, it's actually moderate to considerable. It's not high and extreme. Well, why is that? It's kind of like when a storm comes through and we see accidents on the road with automobiles. Uh, as the storm comes in and it's starting to put snow on the roads, people are caught off guard, right? They're not expecting snow or they weren't expecting so much so fast. They're still out on the roads and they, we see a lot of av uh, accidents during this time period. During the meat of the storm, however, when it's just dropping feet upon feet of snow onto the roads, people just aren't driving. They're staying at home, cooking food, watching a movie. But when that storm leaves again, and the snow plows come out and start to clear the roads, people start driving and we start to see accidents. Same thing with an avalanche cycle. As that storm comes in, it's catching people off guard as conditions are changing really fast. During the meat of that storm, avalanches are coming down everywhere. People are generally pretty smart, right? They stay at home or they stick to the resorts, but it's when that storm leaves again, conditions are still dangerous, but it's not in your face, we start to see a lot of accidents happen again. So we actually see most avalanche fatalities occur at a moderate to considerable danger rating. That's not to say that fatalities don't occur at above or below those ratings, but this is where we see the meat of accidents happen. As you read the avalanche forecast more and more, you'll become familiar with the many different types of avalanches. Why is this important? Well, each type of avalanche is managed differently when we're in the mountains. If the main avalanche problem for the day are small, isolated avalanches, our travel plans would be drastically different than a day when the main avalanche problem are huge, widespread avalanches. Regardless of all these different types of avalanches, they're all dangerous and can have devastating consequences if you're caught in them. The task of changing our travel plans based on the current avalanche problem might seem daunting, but luckily, we can get this information by reading the avalanche forecast. And it's free. So how does a forecast help you? We mentioned earlier that avalanche safety is all about timing. Some days the mountains are screaming at you to stay out. Other days they're greeting you with open arms saying, come on in, let's party. Avalanche forecasts help us understand how to identify these days 
by describing the avalanche danger through a bottom line statement, describing recent and expected weather, reviewing recent avalanches they've seen or heard about in the field, and informing us what type of avalanche problems might exist in the mountains on any given day. By reading the forecast and obtaining as much information as we can before going into the mountains, we can drastically reduce our risk and increase our odds of returning safe and sound to our cars at the end of the day. So we know how to get the regional avalanche forecast and why we need to read it every day, but there's some other things we need to do before we can head out. Next step was we need to get the gear. In this section, we're gonna discuss what the essential avalanche safety gear is, what each piece is used for, and why it's important that everyone carries all three. Even after reading the avalanche forecast, we need to be prepared for the worst. Imagine staring at a massive debris field after an avalanche just swallowed your partner. Can anyone tell me where in this debris field our partner might be located? It's almost impossible, right, without the proper rescue gear. Without that gear, your chances of finding your partner and saving their life is essentially zero. So let's take a look at what gear we need to carry to increase our odds of surviving and why everyone must carry all the essential pieces of gear in this next video. script but I feel like there is so many new users to the backcountry it scares me it scares me that everyone thinks I just buy this expensive gear and I can get on the chairlift and I'll be fine <laughs> get the education, understand how to use it, and have solid backcountry partners. I'm worried about storm slabs in Alpine and Tree Line uh, on all slopes. We had avalanche observed yesterday on the parkway. The reality is backcountry is getting busier and busier. There's just more and more people out there. So with that comes a higher level of risk. We've all heard a lot of stories about people who didn't even have a beacon on or no shovel, no probe. And that would have been the thing that would have saved them. Gotcha. The bottom line is in the back country, it's fun and the accessibility to that terrain is so incredibly easy that there can be a misconception that it is a safe place to be. There are gonna be times that you can open it up, you can have that risk tolerance on those big lines, and then there's gonna be times that you're gonna to have to rein it in. You're gonna make hundreds of decisions that are very important to your life. And unfortunately, one decision, one bad decision, can ultimately end the whole thing right there. Pretty helpless situation to be in if you don't have the right tools. There's really no outside help. You know, it's really up to their partners to get to them as quickly as possible and know how to use a transceiver, a probe, and a shovel, use it well, and dig them out of the snow. In a full burial, your heart's beating and you don't know how long you're going to be riding it out for and how much oxygen you're eventually going to have. Time is of the essence. I want to know when I'm going to
into the backcountry that I have a solid partner and they're super familiar with using that equipment. We're right here. We got you. If you've been in an avalanche and someone's buried, that's where having the gear and knowing how to use it can make all the difference in the outcome. I look at the backcountry as this double-edged sword. Right? On one end of the sword, you can have the best days of your life. It can give you a life of fulfillment, just being in the mountains. But on the other end of that sword is a super dramatic, heavy piece that we have to talk about. So while we're going to focus on that one end of the sword in this segment, we'll get back to the positive stuff, because being in the backcountry is a positive experience. First, let's talk about those three essential pieces of gear. Each piece of avalanche rescue gear plays an important role in the event of an avalanche. We first use our transceivers to navigate the debris field to zero in on where our partner is buried underneath the snow. Once we get to that location, we then get our probes out and try to get a pinpoint, precise, accurate location of where they are. Once you get this positive probe strike, you want to leave that probe in the snow, get your shovel out, assemble it, and dig as if their life depended on it, because guess what? It does. Digging by far takes the most time and most effort of this whole process. Avalanche debris sets up almost like concrete. It's almost like that pile that gets pushed to the end of your driveway by that snow plow. Try digging through that pile as fast as you can for 30 seconds and see how tired you get. It's extremely labor intensive. With very little time to spare, ourselves and our partners need to be extremely well trained with these pieces of equipment to have the best chance of successfully rescuing the victim. Another amazing piece of equipment that can help save your life in the backcountry is an avalanche airbag. When deployed correctly, airbags can help you become the biggest piece of debris in the avalanche, hopefully bringing you to the top of that debris pile. It's almost like a big bag of potato chips, right? If, I, if you're thinking about those, the yellow bag of Lay's, if you want all the big fluffy chips, all you have to do is shake that bag up, open it, and all the fluffy full chips are on the top and all the crumble is at the bottom. Same in an avalanche. You want to be the biggest piece of debris flowing down that mountain. While airbags are great tools to have in the mountains, they're not considered required because they don't always work perfectly. It's like an airbag in a car. While they might help you survive a car accident, they don't protect you 100% of the time. They're still a great tool to have in the backcountry, and I highly recommend everyone gets one. In addition to avalanches, there are many other hazards associated with traveling in the backcountry. Whether on a snow machine, snow bike, skis, or snowboard, a helmet is an important life-saving preventative safety measure to protect you. Additionally, an extensive first aid kit, an extra jacket, an extra pair of gloves can save you in case of trauma or hypothermia, which is a real threat in the mountains. Radios can also drastically improve your group communication, especially when you're riding in stormy conditions or through the trees. Gear repair kit, multi-tool, slope inclinometer, compass, sunscreen, headlamp, hard copy map, uh, and last but not least, food and water. All these things are going to help you in the mountains. And most importantly, you need a bag big enough to carry all this gear. Avalanche uh, airbags have specific pockets for your uh, probe and shovel in addition to having the space to carry all this stuff. If you're going to be traveling in the mountains in the winter, I highly recommend you go to your local shop and get a bag with specific uh, sleeves for your probe and shovel. And it's also big enough to carry all this extra gear you're going to need. So let's take a step back and talk about why this gear is important to carry. First, we need to talk about avalanche trauma. Unfortunately, 25% of avalanche fatalities are caused by trauma that occurs while the avalanche is still taking place, meaning you're getting thrown through trees, over cliffs, into rocks. It's extremely violent. If four people are buried in an avalanche, chances are only three people have a chance of survival by the time the snow stops. While this might sound grim, you have the ability to save the lives of that remaining 75%, but only if you're carrying the essential rescue gear, and you need to know how to use it. So how much time do we have? Take a second to digest this graph. This graph showing probability of surviving an avalanche burial versus burial time might look pretty grim at first, but if you look closely, there's a silver lining. Research has proven that if we can locate and uncover our partner quickly, they have a strong chance of surviving. 10 minutes, however, is not a lot of time to work with. 
Think about hitting the snooze button on your morning alarm. Does that ever feel like enough time? Unfortunately, if you can't locate, probe, and dig out your partner from an avalanche debris in this short time frame, their chances of not coming home are around 80 to 90%. That's why everyone traveling in the mountains must be carrying a transceiver, probe, and shovel. But they also need to know how to use it. Due to how quickly the odds of survival drops as time goes by, the victim's partners are solely responsible for the rescue. Imagine how long it would take to call for help, for that help to arrive, and then have a search for the buried person. It's nearly impossible for a professional rescue team to come and save your life or your partner's life within 10 minutes. Therefore, your partners are the sole rescue party. Right? Gear can find your party, but your partner's knowledge on how to use that gear can actually save your life. And that brings us to this next section, get the training. In this section, we're gonna talk about why training is essential, what you can learn in an on-snow avalanche class. We're also gonna to touch on the fact that education is a lifelong journey. Let's take a look at this video showing the day in the life of an avalanche professional and what are some things you might learn in an on-snow avalanche class. Must have been 19 or 20, and that was just as we were starting to leave the ski hill into the backcountry. And I still remember it was uh, it was a moderate, low, low hazard day, and it had just snowed a little bit, and then the wind really kicked up. My friend just did a big ski turn right above me and popped a slab. And I remember it wasn't even big, and I was like, I'll just hop over this moving snow. But it totally grabbed me, and I was doing the full ragdoll down the hill. I had managed to grab onto a tree and stop myself. As the avalanche went down in the gully, it pulled out the whole rest of the bowl, and this whole big chute went down to the valley floor. If I would have been in that, it would have been terrible, yeah. I was so keen at that point in time, and, and, and really didn't know what was safe and not. That avalanche was definitely a bit eye-opening to how quickly things can go wrong in the backcountry. I got lucky, but unfortunately, a lot of people do not. With a little bit of avalanche training, a lot of accidents can be avoided. Looking at the bulletin, it's been warm yesterday and then uh, cool down quite a bit overnight. Probably the main concern today um, would be the wet and loose uh, on the sunny aspect. If anybody has the motivation to go out into the backcountry, whether that's skiing, sledding, riding, I would say an entry level avalanche course is totally critical. Your general entry-level avalanche course will have fundamental knowledge about avalanches, how snow and layers and snowpack work. Uh, we're just looking for a good site for a profile. Let's dig. Typically, you do a little bit of avalanche rescue practice, so you get your transceivers out, probe, shovel. And the beacon just comes down to the knee, and you just move forward. Practice with that gear so that you know what to do if something were to go wrong. trip planning, reading the avalanche hazard bulletins, and then sort of picking a suitable trip. Uh, you'll do a little bit about traveling through avalanche terrain. The number one problem of the day was the wet loose avalanches, which is what's raising the avalanche hazard for the day. We've got a little one starting. That's a good indicator of where things are going. While the mountains and the snowpack can feel quite complex at times, the sort of entry level avalanche courses give you some fundamental knowledge that allows you to maybe make sense of some of the things that you're observing out in the mountains. And that fundamental knowledge can, can be useful to avoid avalanche accidents. I personally couldn't imagine a life without skiing and climbing in, in the mountains. It just gives you so much vitality in your life, which is awesome. With anything, 
Uh, to be a master of your craft takes a lot of practice and a lot of time, and it's an ongoing, sort of lifelong learning process. I've been working with Avalanches for 15 years now, and I'm still learning every day. So as you heard in that video, avalanche education is a lifelong journey. There's no such thing as too much avalanche education. From avalanche classes to beacon parks, there are many ways to learn about the hazards of avalanches and what to do if your partner is ever caught in one. The best method, however, is getting hands-on, face-to-face experience with an avalanche educator. Not to mention it's fun too. In these avalanche classes, you'll learn much more than we'll cover here tonight. You'll get face-to-face, -face, hands-on training on how to use the avalanche forecast to plan your trip in the mountains. You'll learn how to use your avalanche rescue gear, and you'll learn about some things to stay aware of in the mountains. It's the best place to get all your questions answered. And if you have any questions tonight, don't forget to shoot them into us at the number below. We'll do our best to answer them. When I first started getting to the backcountry, all I could see were amazing mountains draped in snow. And when I looked at these mountains, I would daydream about which line would be the best to ride, where would the deepest snow be. But once I started my avalanche education, however, I began seeing much more than just a beautiful peak covered in powder. I started to learn how tiny features on the slope could tell you a whole lot about the avalanche hazard without actually even stepping foot on snow. Imagine you're traveling through the mountains and you come across this beautiful basin that you see here. While we have an amazing view as it is, there are actually a ton of avalanche clues just waiting to be noticed. Do you see any clues right away? Did you notice this massive slab avalanche in the middle of the mountain? This is a huge obvious clue that avalanches are possible. Avalanches are a herd species, meaning if you see one, there's probably going to be more. So when you see an avalanche in the field, you want to pay attention to what aspect it's on, what elevation it's on, what was the trigger, and maybe even what was the weak layer. And then, when you're in the mountains for that day, you can just avoid slopes that are similar to this. It's that easy. Do you see anything else in this picture that might indicate avalanche danger is possible? Did you notice this smaller, loose snow avalanche? This is on a completely different aspect as the one we just saw. It's a lot smaller than the one we just saw. It's on a sunny slope as opposed to a shady slope. All these things I'm thinking about just from leaving my car and looking up at the mountains. I'm getting a ton of different clues as to what's happening in the snow. In fact, there's a ton of information you can extrapolate just by looking at a mountain. Too much to go over in this presentation. But by taking an avalanche class, this allows you to unlock the mountains and see them in a way you've never seen before. Forgoing this education can leave you blind in a dangerous environment. So how do we sign up for an avalanche class? Well, it's easy. Check your local avalanche center. They'll have classes listed that they offer. They'll have classes listed that other providers offer. You can also go to kbyg.org. We have a ton of free online learning content. There's a online, new online learning platform, uh, extended learning opportunities, books you can check out to continue your, your learning. All this is totally free for you. You can, you can browse this site for hours and still not get to the bottom of it, so check it out. Okay, so we just talked about getting the forecast, getting the right gear, and knowing how to use it through, get in a, through an on-snow avalanche class. This brings us to our final chapter, getting the picture. Getting the picture is all about being aware in the mountains, right? You know how to read a forecast. You know what gear you need. You know where to find a class. But in this section, we're gonna learn how to identify avalanche terrain so you can avoid avalanches, learn safe travel habits to minimize your risk, and learn how to identify rising avalanche conditions in the field. Let's take a look at an avalanche professional in the field and see how they take on the mountains for a day. Avalanche terrain is simply terrain steep enough to shred. The reality is that the fun places in the backcountry are the places where avalanches are possible. It only takes one bad mistake to. Uh... Avalanche, avalanche. Killed in an avalanche. To lead to a lot of pain. 
for a lot of people. In order to safely travel in the backcountry, you need to understand the bigger picture. Firstly, you need to recognize avalanche terrain and how to safely travel through it. Secondly, you need to constantly observe the ever-changing conditions. Welcome to the final chapter. It's really important to understand that the second you step in the back country, you're going into terrain that hasn't received any active avalanche mitigation. It's important that you can recognize avalanche terrain. By definition, avalanche terrain is any slope steeper than 30 degrees. No one can be a perfect avalanche forecaster. Snow science is an inexact science. When you look at the forecast in the morning and make that assessment, you have to be prepared for the fact that the conditions could actually change during the day. The one constant is terrain. And what we can do is position ourselves with best terrain practices through it. So you think about moving through the mountains, there is safe zone to safe zone. And it's those best terrain practices that set us up for success. We're all going out as a group for the A objective, but along the way, we may have some sort of weather characteristic that changes that decision. It's really helpful to just have some big red flags that are telling you it's time to reevaluate. And those things are rapid snowfall, rapid wind, shooting cracks, wumpfing, recent avalanches, or rapid warm-up. We've just moved to the trees, and at this point, wherever we go is avalanche terrain. In order to minimize our exposure as a group, we're gonna go from safe zone to safe zone, moving one at a time through this terrain. Having guidelines are very effective ways to give yourself a framework where you're less inclined to make emotional decisions that could be bad ones. Just like on the way up, we're gonna expose one person at a time on this slope. I'm about to drop in. Do you guys have eyes on? Yes. Awesome, let's do that. Dropping in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. The skill set to safely travel in the backcountry is something that's achievable by anybody. It's important that you dedicate yourself to understanding the basics. So you've got the gear, you've got the training, you've got the forecast, you've got the picture. Let's go get the goods. So there's a lot to take in with this final chapter of getting the picture. Let's start with the most important topic in the video. Can you tell me what exactly is avalanche terrain? We keep hearing this magic number of 30 degrees, right? But how do we know what that looks like when we're in the mountains? Let's take a look at some examples. Does this look like 30 degrees? Yeah, to me it does, right? And there's obviously a massive avalanche in this picture. This is clearly over 30 degrees. It looks fun to ride, and normally that's my cue to tell me that it is 30 degrees or above. There's also something else going on in this picture. There's tons of tracks, right? Tracks that you can see that didn't quite get hit by the avalanche, but quite a few tracks that we saw did in fact get hit by the avalanche. Just because there's tracks on the slope does not mean it's safe to ride. What about this next photo? Is this 30 degrees? No, to me it doesn't look like 30 degrees. We can't see any slopes next to it or adjacent to it that are steep. It seems like a pretty fun, safe slope. But more importantly, it looks like they're having a ton of fun. That's why it's super important to know how to identify avalanche terrain. Not only to identify it to stay out of, but also to identify terrain that isn't avalanche terrain. Because guess what? If you're not in avalanche terrain, you can't get caught in an avalanche. But why does this matter? Right? Like I said, we need to know where to go on days where the danger is a little bit elevated, but we still want to have fun. But most importantly, we want to know where not to go when the conditions are dangerous. 
the line between 28 degrees and 32 degrees is really hard to identify. Something that I struggle with all the time, and I'm in the mountains almost every day. I always carry an avalanche inclinometer with me, constantly taking guesses and then checking my guess at what the slope angle is on a slope, because I want to train my eyes to be as best as they can be to identify what 30 degrees is. This line is invisible, but it's the line between life, life or death. Super important that you're able to identify what is and isn't avalanche train when you're moving through the mountains. What if we're not traveling on skis or a split board? What if we're in the mountains for a scenic hike or we're grouped up on our sleds watching our partner ride? The same rules apply, even if you're not on a slope that's above or below 30 degrees. You need to always be paying attention to what's above you, because guess what? What's above you can avalanche and come down on you. Wherever you're sitting in the mountains, whether you're stopped up for lunch or regrouping or watching your friend ride a slope, you always need to be asking, if an avalanche came down right now, am I in its path? What about these photos? What's wrong with these photos? Yeah, there's a ton of people in them. If an avalanche came down and swept out eight of the nine people in the left-hand photo, what would that leave that one person left to do? They'd have to rescue eight of their closest friends in a period of 10 minutes. That's just not possible. People are going to get hurt. So if you have to travel through avalanche train, only expose one person at a time. That just leaves more of you for the rescue instead of people who need to be rescued. So why don't we have to worry about what is and isn't 30 degrees or safe travel protocols when we're riding in the resort? Well, lucky for us, the resorts have a team of people who are out there at the crack of dawn trying to cause avalanches so that they don't happen when you're skiing in bounds. This is why I love to ride resorts uh, on days where there is high avalanche danger. Because I'm not turning my brain off, but I can let my guard down just slightly and kind of ski in a more fun way, right? Ski patrollers are doing a lot of the work for us in, in mitigating the avalanche hazard. Doesn't mean you can't turn your brain off completely, but it's a fun place to go if the danger is high. As soon as you cross that boundary line, however, none of that work exists. You could be 20 feet from a boundary line. I'm willing to bet no one has done any avalanche mitigation past that boundary line. Even if a patroller is standing on one side of the boundary and watches you and your partner get caught in an avalanche out of bounds, they might have to go through six different steps of protocol to even take their jacket off and go into the rescue. Just because you're right next to the resort doesn't mean help is quick to get to you. If you're in the backcountry, if you cross that boundary line, you and your partners are responsible for each other's lives. And if you go over to Europe, things are a little bit different there, right? We have off-piste and on-piste. In Europe, even if you're in a resort boundary, if it hasn't been groomed, there's a chance that it hasn't been controlled for avalanches. So if you do ski in Europe, just check with their local ski patrol for uh, the rules and regulations. Okay, so you might have mentioned in the video uh, how to reassess your plans if conditions are dangerous, right? Well, how do we know that avalanche conditions are changing? The snowpack is always talking, and it's our job to listen. Avalanches aren't just random acts of nature. We can usually tell when they're about to happen. And there are a few clues to look for that scream an avalanche might occur. Can you guess what that most obvious sign is? It's recent avalanches. You heard me talk about this earlier. Avalanche, again, are a herd species, meaning if you see one, there's probably going to be more. So you want to pay attention to what aspect, elevation, what was the trigger of that avalanche, and maybe even get some hints as to what that weak layer was. And then throughout the day, you can just avoid similar slopes. The next red flag we have is cracking and collapsing. Cracking is an easy one to spot. Uh, if you're ever walking out in the field or if you're out in your snowmobile and you see a crack shoot out from the tip of your skis, that's a clear indication that avalanches are possible. Collapsing is a little bit more ambiguous. Uh, if you ever walk around in a flat meadow that's been untouched, if you ever feel yourself sink just ever so slightly and you might even hear an audible woomph, that was actually an avalanche. That was the weak layer failing. It just wasn't on a slope steep enough to slide. But if you were on a slope steep enough to slide, you might have triggered an avalanche and you might get yourself in trouble. So if you ever see cracking or if you feel or hear collapsing in the field, it's time to reevaluate your plans. The next red flag we have is wind drifted snow. This one's easy to spot. I hate the wind. It's super annoying when you're in the mountains. But when it is windy, I'm paying attention to what direction it's coming from and how fast it's blowing. Because this is going to tell me where on the mountain wind drifts are going to form. Wind drifts are super sensitive pieces of snow that can avalanche pretty easily within hours or maybe even days after a wind event. Super important to pay attention to the wind, where it's coming from, and where it's going. 
The fourth red flag we have is heavy snowfall or rain. This one's a bit of a letdown, because when the snow is coming down by the feet, the riding must be good out there. However, we must have patience. With heavy snowfall comes a ton of weight being added to the snowpack in a short period of time. The snowpack, like people, don't like rapid change. With that new additional load, the snowpack needs time to adjust and heal itself ever so slightly as time goes on. Rain is an easy one to make a decision on because it's when, it, when it's raining in the mountains, not only is avalanche danger increasing, but our comfortability is decreasing. No one wants to be out there in the rain, so when it is raining, just go back to your car. The fifth and last red flag we have is rapidly rising temperatures. This is an easy red flag to identify because we're normally overheating just like the snow is. Rapid, ri rapidly rising temperatures can cause a snow surface to lose cohesion, which causes the likelihood of wet avalanches to rise. In addition to feeling this rise in temperature ourselves, the mountains will begin showing signs that it's time to turn around or head to shadier slopes. Rollerballs or pinwheels shown in these pictures indicate that the snow surface is becoming too wet for safe travel. When we see these rollerballs, it's time to turn around or head for those shadier slopes. Okay, so we just talked for quite a bit about avalanches. It can seem a bit overwhelming. But by following these four simple steps, you'll be on track to gain the proper education and experience needed to have fun while in the mountains. You know how to get the forecast, what information is included in them, and how it can keep you safe. You know what gear you must carry. You know the importance of signing up for an avalanche class, and you know some safe travel practices when moving through the mountains. Now it's time to make the next step and get the goods. So where do you go from here? Scan this code or go to kbyg.org for the next steps of your avalanche education journey. Here you'll find everything you need to take your education to the next level, in addition to tons of other information about avalanche safety. Thank you all for attending this presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, text them in. We're going to do our best to answer them now. OK, looks like we got our first couple questions coming in. Hey, Mac, where does KBYG fit into a person's overall avalanche education journey? So the question is, where does KBYG, this program you just watched, fit into anyone's avalanche education journey? Uh, well, like I said at the top of this program, the Know Before You Go program was designed to be the first step in anyone's avalanche education journey. We give you these four fundamental points to get started, learn a little bit more, gain a little bit of experience for yourself, and then sign up for an on snow avalanche class. So this is kind of the first step in your journey, but it's also a good refresher to come back to uh, after each year. What advice do you have for someone just starting to learn about avalanche safety? So the question is, what advice do you have for someone who's just starting to learn about avalanche safety? Uh, thinking back to my own avalanche education path, uh, I moved to the Mountain West right after high school, right at 18 years old. And I was just so amped to get into the mountains and ride some big lines. Um, and I just had no idea about the dangers that those mountains possessed. Uh, so I think first step you should be is uh, Get signed up for an avalanche class. Start reading the forecast every single day. Right? It's almost like reading a book. It's hard to jump into a forecast halfway through the season and figure out where to go. But if you start from the beginning, you get a full view of what's happening in the snow, uh, and you'll be set up. So read the forecast, get into an on-snow class, and start going to shops and testing out gear. What can I do at home to help teach my kids about avalanches? The question is, uh, what can I do at home to help my kids learn about avalanches? Well, Lucky for you, in this day and age, we have tons of free information available online. Uh, go to kbyg.org. That's the first place I would show them. We have tons of cool videos, really cool online learning platform that's all new this year. It takes about five to six hours to complete. You can do it on your own time. Uh, and this program is designed for a 13-year-old and up. Um, and that's not to say we don't present this program to people younger. right? So it's never too soon to get them thinking about avalanches. Get that seed planted in their head that there's things they need to do before they can go into the backcountry. I'm a snowshoer, and I generally just snowshoe on the same trails that I hike in the summer. How do I know if these trails are safe or if they're an avalanche terrain? Awesome question. So the question we got was, uh, I'm a snowshoer. I'm sticking to the same trails I, I hike in the summer, but now I'm going to be in the, in the winter. How do I know uh, if I'm an avalanche terrain or if the avalanche danger uh, is, is high? That's an easy answer. Just read the avalanche forecast. They're going to tell you if there's mountains coming or avalanches coming down from the tops of the mountains to the valley bottom, or maybe there's just small isolated avalanches running a couple hundred feet. 
But by reading that forecast the morning before you go out, you'll get that information on what to expect. Um, and also just, just look up, look around. If you see a slope that looks steep directly above you, you're probably in avalanche terrain. Last question we have is, how can I schedule a presentation at my ski shop? So the last question we have for today is how to schedule one of these presentations in person at a ski shop uh, or at a restaurant or a club. Um, reach out to your regional avalanche forecast or avalanche center. Um, you can go to kbyg.org to find where your regional center is located online. Shoot them an email and ask them uh, when they can come down. We love giving these presentations, not only because we love teaching people about avalanches, but these fundamental points that everyone must learn are a great way um, to get involved with the community and, and make a, a personal uh, uh, touch with, with that community. So reach out to your regional avalanche center and uh, get a presentation scheduled today. So that's all the questions we have for today. Uh, if you do have any additional questions, just send us an email at info at kbyg.org. I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Mammut, for putting this on today as part of their Avalanche Safety Week. I hope you all, all are getting excited for the winter. I know there's snow coming down all over the place. Um, we'll see you out there on the skin track. Thanks for joining. Oh, <laughs> 